Laura. Hi, I'm so happy to see you. How are you today? Hi, I'm good. Thank you so much for having me. So last time we met, we had face paint on our faces. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we and were we were marching. <laughs> the march yes. How did how was it for you that experience? Because I, I, it was truly amazing for me. Like I couldn't sleep for nights afterwards. Like the chants all in my head, and it was just really quite amazing. Yes, I, it was such a nice feeling of solidarity and energy and support. And this can be quite lonely work. And I think getting together with a huge crowd of other people who are doing the same kind of work and knowing that you're not alone and that there is so much effort and, and pressure brain brought to bear on these systems was really energizing and empowering, I thought. Yes. Well, thank you, Pregnant Then Screwed. And thank you, Laura, for the part you played. You were awesome. <laughs> so I'd love... I'd love to hear your story. Like lots of folks listening will have read your books, will follow you on Instagram, will know about everyday sexism. You have done so many incredible things. And you're also a mother and a woman just trying to, you know, show up in the world and do your best. So what who are you and what do you care about? Well, I think I'm an accidental activist, really. Um, mm. I I had a really terrible week <laughs> in 2012 where I was followed home by a man really refusing to take no for an answer. I was sexually assaulted by a man on a bus and I said what was happening out loud because I was on the phone to my mum and everybody on the bus heard and everybody looked out the window. Mm. And a few days later, some men were shouting about my body and things they would do to me as I walked past them in the street. And for the first time ever, I stopped and realized that if those things hadn't happened so close together, I might never have thought twice about any one of them because it was normal. I was so mm. used to being treated in that way. And the Everyday Sexism Project was a very, very simple effort to get people to recognize the ubiquity and the severity of the problem. Because when I started talking to other women and girls, asking them the very simple question, has anything like this ever happened to you? I was completely overwhelmed by the sheer scale of their responses. It was every woman I spoke to, and it wasn't one story from a few years ago. It was in work every day or on my way to meet you just now. But mm. when I tried to talk about sexism, people told me sexism doesn't exist anymore. Women are equal now. There's no issues. So the project was an attempt, not necessarily even to fix sexism, but to get people to see it. Mm. And where, what was your life like at that time? Because I'm assuming, you know, you weren't an entrepreneur, you weren't building businesses, you weren't online. Like, what, so tell no. me about that. <laughs> tell me about that. Part. I was an actress. I was working as an actress. I was auditioning for things like Game of Thrones and Casualty and music videos and adverts. I was turning up at auditions and being told to take my top off or being sent into casting rooms with another actress and told to make increasingly loud orgasm noises until the casting director had heard enough. I had so many experiences of misogyny in that particular career. Um, and so it's really telling, I think, that it wasn't till I started the project that I drew the connections. Um, mm. I only fairly recently at the time graduated from a university where there was a professor who would wear a black armband every year on the day that women had been admitted to the college as a form of mourning. Um, and it, it, it was, it's fascinating to me to look back at how steeped my life was in experiences of misogyny, sexual violence, sexual harassment, and yet how bereft I was of the language and the mm. understanding to feel able to name them for what they were. Mm. and that must have taken a lot of courage and confidence you know a lot of the women listen to this and the women in our bond community there they have a there's a thing that they want to create or make or start and I often think confidence is that is that it's the bridge between having the idea and wanting to do it and actually doing the thing is yeah that how, maybe you know, I think if I had known what I was getting myself into, I might never have done it, <laughs> to uh -huh, be honest. Uh -huh. 
I thought it would just be, it was really just an expression of rage and frustration. And I just wanted somewhere where other people could hear all these stories. So they would stop telling me it didn't exist. And if I'd known setting it up, that it would become a, a, the biggest data set of its kind that had ever been collected, mm -hmm. that it would have a quarter of a million testimonies 10 years on, that it would be used wow. by MPs and schools and businesses. I don't know if I'd have felt that I was the person to do it. I probably wouldn't. Um, but it, it, it was an, I, a seed of an idea that grew and grew. And I think I've grown with it. And mm -hmm. my confidence has grown with it. And I definitely think it's just been a matter of, of practice mm -hmm. and anger and um, kind of feeling so furious that I had to do something, even if it was scary. But certainly, I think if, if I'd looked back then and, and known that this would mean you know talking to 4,000 people at Wembley Arena or something I'd have gone well no way but that wasn't how it started it started with a student group saying will you come in and talk to our 12 person mm -hmm. feminist society and that felt really scary at the time but little mm -hmm. by little I think my confidence built as I practiced and learned on the job yeah and keeping on going right 10 years is a long time yeah, I think I think for me, the urgency comes from the stories that continue to pour mm. in. You're hearing from tens of thousands of women and girls every year who are being discriminated against at work, who are losing their jobs because they get pregnant, who are being sexually assaulted at school and then blamed for it. And I just don't think you can hear and read those stories every day and not feel like you have to keep going. But I also think that sense of community and the number of other incredible women who are campaigning and working so hard in this sphere keeps you going as well, because you know you're not alone. Mm. And that was, I really wanted to ask you about that because you are immersed in this very dark place of male violence and sexism. And there's also an element of that that I imagine often is personal and feels personal. And like, I'd love to know, like what, for you, what's the hardest part of all of that? And what's, what keeps you going? You've mentioned the kind of solidarity and support from other women, peers of yours in different areas of, you know, fighting this fight. Yeah, it, I mean, it is really difficult and I don't want to sugarcoat it. Like on mm. a bad day, I can get 200 rape threats and death threats in a single day. And it mm. has impacted my life in very deep ways. You know, I now have live with police panic alarms in my home and that kind of thing. And that does take a really great toll. I think the, the, the place I draw hope from is partly seeing the real life changes that I know are happening because of the work. That's mm -hmm. really useful for me whether it's on an individual level men who say that they've read the entries on the website and they've changed something in their workplace as a result uh, women who say that they've felt able to report something or that they don't feel alone for the first time or on a bigger scale knowing that the project entries helped to put consent on the curriculum knowing that they changed the way that the British Transport Police deal with sexual offences that keeps you going being able to see tangible change and also for me it's the work I do in schools I do a lot of work with young people and I see a generation of girls who are so courageous and fighting so hard against injustices that at their age I wouldn't have had a name for and that's mm. really positive and hopeful there are, we know there have been hundreds of new feminist societies set up across the country at schools and universities in the last few years and when you go into schools now and you meet girls who are, you know, they're turning up at school the day after they've been told that they can't wear leggings because it might distract their boys in their mm. class. With placards that say, are oh, my leggings lowering your test scores? <laughs> this is an amazing, <laughs> amazing generation of girls who are fighting back. And that makes me really hopeful and keeps you going. Yes, that makes me happy yeah. to, to imagine their conversations because you're right. I certainly didn't have that language and I think language is such a powerful tool when you have the words to articulate what is happening what you see what you're feeling um and it's it is scary to hear you talk about the the threats and the fear and I can only imagine you know how difficult that is and I 
I wonder, you know, how that shows up for you when you're that is your day to day reality. And then often I hear people quizzing you in interviews and on TV panels of, well, what about the men? Like, shouldn't we be? <laughs> and it's funny because in at upfront in my world, I'm starting to have kind of many versions of those conversations because our our product and our community is very much focused on women and we've had several clients lately kind of really challenge that and feel very uncomfortable with the idea that we are creating something just for women and of course I've got lots to say about that I feel strongly <laughs> that we are doing you know the, the right thing in the right way but I would love to hear your perspective on that and kind of yeah how you think about that and what you say to people women mm. and men because let's be honest often the often this message comes from women too um this idea of you know what about the men yeah well I think a huge amount of the work that we're doing is absolutely for and about also supporting men and beneficial to them you know mm -hmm. uh, so often I think we make this mistake of falling into this kind of media narrative that this is men against women, it's a battle mm -hmm. of the sexes, it's a gender war, and that if we are platforming, supporting, empowering, fighting for women, that must automatically mean either taking something away from or attacking all men, or even in a more benign sense, just sort of ignoring them or forgetting them. But the truth is so much of feminist activism is beneficial to men and boys as well you know whether you're talking about tackling body image which is having a massive impact on men and boys as well as women and girls or whether you're dismantling the gender stereotypes which are absolutely at the root of many of the problems men face the male suicide rate being a very clear example of this people often raise that as a kind of example of what about the men you know how can you bang on about feminism when the male suicide rate is three times higher than it is for women mm -hmm. and the answer to that is that feminism is absolutely about tackling that precise problem because we know that the male suicide rate is linked to the fact that men are drastically less likely to receive mental health support when they're in crisis we mm -hmm. know that that is linked to the fact that they're brought up in a world that teaches them boys don't cry, men are tough and manly, don't be vulnerable, don't have feelings. You know, the American Psychological Association say that um, subscription to sort of rigid gender stereotypes is correlated to men being dramatically less likely to reach out for help and support. Mm. So tackling these things is absolutely about supporting and will be beneficial for everyone. But that isn't to say that it isn't a gendered issue. It is. We we can't pretend that it's not. You have to name a problem to solve the problem. And that fem part of the word feminism is in there because it is women who globally bear the brunt of physical and sexualized violence. You know, one in three women on the planet will be raped or beaten in her lifetime. We are experiencing an epidemic of sexual violence in our schools and it is disproportionately impacting girls. Uh, you know, these are facts that we have to take into account when we're tackling the problem because otherwise it becomes meaningless. Mm. And I know you talked a lot about the online you know, presence of incel groups. And obviously there was a recent scandal with Andrew Tate and, you know, suddenly that story was in the headlines of the depth of harm that these men and their stories are causing. What do you, because I know there's a lot of mums listening who are really scared and they have teenagers of both genders and it's how do we how do we support our young people to navigate this kind of online minefield? So I think there's a lot of different ways to approach it, and hopefully the more yeah. of them we adopt, the better. Mm -hmm. I think partly we need to be talking about these things in schools from a much younger age, not just talking about kind of pornography and extreme misogyny, but more broadly talking about things like internet literacy, so that when they see conspiracy theories online, they don't necessarily fall for them. Um, and that doesn't just mean expecting teachers to magically know how to do that out of thin air. We need to be funding it. We need to be resourcing teachers to do it in school. 
And in terms of kind of parents, I think there's a massive piece to do with accessibility of those conversations. Mm. It's about encouraging open, uh, empathetic communication with young people so they know that they can talk to you about those things without being judged or kind of shut down or told off starting little and often it doesn't have to be one big terrifying conversation you know it can be a chat about a billboard that you've just driven past or a piece that's come on the radio about Andrew Tate asking questions is usually better than kind of preaching at them letting them express anxieties and concerns that they might have and looking together for the answers and I think for parents particularly kind of it can be really useful to familiarize yourself a bit with the online landscape that young people are navigating mm. it's a very different world from the one that many adults inhabit on the internet so you know getting on TikTok having a look at some of the men's rights stuff that you might see on Reddit looking at some of the biggest comedy accounts on Instagram memes what's you know kind of memes are being shared maybe um, going onto YouTube and looking up video about women and then seeing where the algorithm takes you these are all things that parents can do to kind of give them a, more of a kind of idea a baseline mm. and I think the other thing is actually policy makers that we can't mm. do this on our own and the reason that some of these misconceptions and conspiracy theories are spreading so effectively is because the internet has essentially turned social media platforms into mass radicalization machines mm. you know tiktok had pushed out videos of andrew tate's material to over 11 billion people that's more than the number of people on the planet was the number of times it had been viewed mm -hmm views I should say not people so you know we can't do this while there is this enormous giant of technology kind of spewing out mm -hmm. the opposite stuff so we have to see some regulation meaningful regulation mm. we have to see accountability for tech platforms who are making billions and billions of dollars um, to their vulnerable people who are using them and the people interacting with those vulnerable people as well yeah there's definitely accountability and responsibility to be had that's currently just Nothing. absent. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And one of the kind of trends that I've noticed in my own kind of bubble of these social media platforms, and it's making me so sad because it's coming from women, women who have significant platforms whether they're comedians influencers often in the kind of motherhood space and there seems to be this trend of making content which is essentially making fun of men and boys for being incompetent so mm -hmm. for example you know it's like the mum who is on holiday in a beach somewhere and our kids calling her to say where's my ipad even though the dad's sitting next to the kids and London mm. and then the teenager goes and asks his mum where the hoover is and every day in the family faints and it's when I look at those I always go to the comments and there are thousands and thousands of women in those comments laughing and you know I don't want to ever shame anybody for laughing or finding that connection because I think part of it is a like oh I feel I feel less alone now mm -hmm. in this because that's that's what I see in my house but I think we're missing the part of the conversation which is this is not okay like that I I am horrified to think of my son growing up and thinking we would laugh at him for asking to use the hoover because he mm -hmm. never cleans and he doesn't know what housework is like mm -hmm. what's your take on that I mean I I've, I've not figured it out I don't think there's like there's a nice neat answer but it's been on my mind a lot because mm. I see the comments and think wow this is people aren't seeing that this is a problem it, and it's part of the mm. same problem that you've just been talking about with in, in, our, in the previous part of our conversation yeah and I think it's part of a wider set of assumptions about gendered roles particularly in the home I think quite mm. often in the domestic sphere is left behind in these conversations so you can have situations where people are you know really um, prominent even kind of you know talking about these issues or you know really tackling them in the workplace and then they go home and still we know that men are doing dramatically less childcare, dramatically mm -hmm. fewer household tasks than women, 
even in uh, couples where both partners work, um, if it's a heterosexual couple. Um, we also know that this is absolutely something that's kind of pushed out by advertising and media. It's so common mm -hmm. to see those adverts where the man is kind of mocked for being unable to do basic household mm -hmm tasks so i think for me this is a good example of an arena where male leadership would be useful you know you mm. said earlier that kind of what about the men you know how do we include men in this and i think what's exciting is rather than men kind of turning up and saying where's my make space for me in feminism taking the spaces in the world that they inhabit and making them feminists so we need to see many more male role models openly whether it's doing domestic chores and talking about it, whether mm -hmm. it's male role models talking about uh, caregiving, um, whether it's male role models being open and emotional and vulnerable, and we need to platform those role models. And I think a great example of that is, you know, men like Marcus Rashford, mm -hmm. men like Daniel Radcliffe, Andy Murray, Jordan Stevens. You know, there's a lot of conversation at the moment that those role models don't exist. And the truth is that they do. Um, but perhaps we need to give them more airtime and exposure and we need to kind of step away from some of those outdated stereotypes. Yeah. And I know Beyond Equality are doing some great work in that space. I know they they teamed up with Gina Martin and put some resources together around the Andrew Tate piece. And for International Women's Day, they're teaming up with Casey Robinson, who's part of our upfront team around what role can men play on a day like International Women's Day? So we'll put the links to those awesome. events in the comments. I'd love to also know more about your writing because, of course, you've written your Fix the System, Not the Women book, but you've also started to write novels. And I'd love to just hear a wee bit about that journey. But also for me, that links back to confidence because I think... For me, and I'm, and I think a lot of folks feel this way. It's much easier to be visible and to be public and outspoken about something that is not about you. You know, mm -hmm. I think writing a novel feels much more vulnerable and yes. personal. Requires more like the pain of the creative cycle. So <laughs> yeah, I'd love to know about like how did that come about and. You know what's next for you what are you working on now well it came about because I was doing all this work in schools and I'd written a book girl up which was a kind of feminist mm -hmm. toolkit for young people but I was really aware of the fact that when I was that age when I was a teenager I wouldn't probably have been reading non-feminist books mm -hmm. uh, non-fiction feminist books or even really non-fiction books at all um, but I devoured fiction. So for me, it was quite pragmatic. I very much saw the fiction as an extension of my activism mm -hmm. um, because my books um, are novels for young adults and they deal with issues like um, sort of slut shaming, revenge pornography, rape culture. Mm -hmm. And it was in important for me to try and find ways to engage young people in conversations about those issues that weren't necessarily just in a purely kind of nonfiction, sex and relationships education space, but also in the kind of more cultural space as well. Because of course, that's the space where they're getting a lot of this from kind of cultural touch points and memes. And mm -hmm. I think that the right is much better at sort of weaponizing and um, capitalizing on cultural touch points to make their point and to open up ideas than we are on the left. So I liked that idea of kind of exploring it in a different way. And to be completely honest, it's also kind of lighter relief for me from the really mm -hmm. heavy topics mm. that I write about in my nonfiction. It's a real joy. It's a creative outlet. And it's another way of kind of channeling the same conversations, the same sorts of issues, um, which I've really, really enjoyed. Um, my first novel for uh, young adults, The Burning, um, mm. it's set a kind of contemporary slut shaming story alongside um a true story of a woman in scotland who was accused of witchcraft um kind of to make the point that very little has changed in 400 years and that essentially mm -hmm. teenage girls are facing a very modern form of witch hunt now mm -hmm. um, and at the moment i'm working on a very exciting um duology so it's a two novels in a series Yay. and I can't say a huge amount about them, um, <laughs> but they're set in a um, Arthurian time period, which has always been um, a real love and passion of mine. So it's very exciting. 
okay amazing and how do you how do you write like what's your what's your what does your practice look like um I tend to be quite a haphazard and chaotic writer um <laughs> so I have a vague idea of where things are going and then I start writing and usually about halfway through I actually put together a plan for the whole thing and the structure of what it's going to look like but I don't usually do that until I've already got perhaps a third at least of the novel under my belt because I kind of it's almost like a kind of exploration it's very different for me from non-fiction with my non-fiction, I know everything I want to say. I know all of the facts. I know all the people I'm going to interview. I know exactly what the different pillars are that need to be covered and what order they're going to come in. So I could give you a complete plan of that book before I sit down to write it. Mm -hmm. But with the fiction, I feel like I'm I'm exploring it. I'm adventuring as I go along and the, the characters that you're writing and the plots will take sudden twists and turns that you have not expected and they'll kind of take you in new directions and that's part of the joy and the appeal of it for me so I quite like taking a much more kind of free-flowing approach with the fiction mm. oh amazing well I hope our readers will check out your novels for the young adults in their life all the children in my life are still too little but as soon as they're teenagers <laughs> they'll all get one and I really remember reading Girl Up I must have been my early 20s I think and I remember this feeling of like see like it was like a evidence that I could throw on the table and and because at that time it was am I imagine you know have I been imagining this or surely this is all kind of figured out now and we've passed mm -hmm. the time of you know it's, it's all about wolf whistling or so yeah you're your work is having such an impact on so many people in so many different ways. So a huge thank you for everything that you do. Mm -hmm. And my last question that I ask all our Upfront Moment guests. So Upfront, we are inspired by your um, perspective and one that we share. We talk a lot about changing confidence, not women. So we are really trying to educate and inspire women as to what's possible when we let go of a lot of these really false and often harmful ideas that we've been taught about what a confident person looks like and what all of our work is showing us is that when that happens and women kind of go through that transformation they find themselves you know it's much easier to say no it's much easier to ask for what you need it's much easier to prioritize your own needs to speak up to speak out to write uh, I mean it really does touch like every area of your life but from your kind of vantage point in the world how do you think the world would be will be different when we achieve our goal of supporting one million women mm. Well, I think that the trickle down effect will be absolutely massive. Um, I think so often we focus on either top down change or grassroots change. And I think it needs to be both at the same time. I think I think that women deserve to be in positions that they aren't necessarily in at the moment. And that if we mm -hmm. were able to remove some of the barriers in their way, there would be so much that would be beneficial in terms of institutional transformation. Um, I think that we we force women into silence, whether it's um, victimizing and attacking whistleblowers or whether it's teaching girls not to ever feel that they have the confidence to speak out in the first place. And when we do that, we don't just fail those individual women. We also are failing in our institutions and our systems. Um, it, I think at the moment we have a very institutionally misogynistic society, and I hope that as more and more women feel able to take their place in positions of leadership, that will change. Mm. Yeah. And I I would really love to do more work with schools. We get emails every week saying, are you going to run a programme for, for young girls? So maybe we could talk about that one time on That's a great idea. how we can help get our message to to teenagers, because I think you're right it's you know there's no one solution that can solve this mm -hmm. it's we all have our different places bringing down the wall Definitely. Um, but thank you so much I mean I could just 
talk to you forever <laughs> there's so many questions and I think you know 10 years so much has changed in 10 years I mean so little has also changed in the same breath but if we think about the conversations we're having around this now you know that that does make me feel hopeful for the me next too. 10 years so thank you so much Laura thank you thank you for having me okay bye bye Thank <laughs> you.